Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. We hurt each other in word, action, and inaction. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Jesus Christ, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Power, riches, wisdom, and strength, and honor, blessing, and glory are his. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing, honor, glory, and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. For the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia! This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia! 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 Let us pray. O oh God, our teacher and guide, you draw us to yourself and welcome us as beloved children. Help us to lay aside all envy and selfish ambition that we may walk in your ways of wisdom and understanding as servants of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 11. It was the Lord who made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their evil deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter, and I did not know it was against me, that they devised schemes, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, so that his name will no longer be remembered. 
But you, O Lord of hosts, who judge righteously, who try the heart and the mind, let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. my cause, accept my prayer, and to my words give ear. Mere strangers whom I never wronged to ruin me have designed, and cruel men that fear no God against my soul combined. But God takes part with all my friends, and he is the surest God. The God of truth shall give my foes their falsehoods do reward. While I my grateful offering bring and sacrifice with joy, and in his praise my time to come delightfully employ. From dreadful danger and distress the Lord hath set me free. Through shall I of all my foes the just destruction see. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is, er unearth is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus and the disciples went on and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. 
and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way they had argued with one another, who is the greatest? He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first among, among you, whoever wants to be first, must be last and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It is good to be here with you at Resurrection Lutheran Church, uh, subbing for my former student, Pastor David Campais. Um, who uh, I have, actually I was telling someone before the service your last three pastors were all students of mine at one point or another but I want to it's been a few years since I've been here but I'd like to um, as I always do when I guest preach um, bring you greetings from my faculty and staff colleagues at Trinity Lutheran Seminary at Capital University and also to thank you for your partnership with us as we strive to fulfill our mission which is to form leaders for Christ Church at work in the world you have done this over the years by being a leadership in context site. Um, the church, as you know, needs leaders. It needs pastors and, and deacons and other leaders. And so I want to invite you to partner with us in another way and consider who you know here in your other circles, that somebody that might have gifts for ministry, even if they're pretty young yet, um, planting that seed um, can't be done too early. If, if someone has gifts for ministry and you think would make a good pastor or other um, rostered leader in the church, um, please encourage them. Uh, pray with them and encourage them to think about that. And, of course, we'd be pleased to speak with them, too. There's no children's sermon um, for the service today. And I guess that's um, uh, something some churches do and some don't. And I've done them both sometimes and other times I haven't. But if there was one... And so you're going to get a little mini one right here. I might just sing the song, Jesus Loves the Little Children, right? You know, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, and how they are precious in his sight. And probably if I walked around your church, I might see a picture. I know that in the churches that I've served in the past, there's always somewhere hanging a picture of Jesus surrounded by lots of children, He's holding some in his arms, some maybe in his lap, and they're all kind of around him. And you can usually tell when the picture was, you know, um, painted or taken because <laughs> the children will often reflect a certain era. And, and a certain, um, a lot of them will look pretty, you know, North American a lot of times. But this is a very common piece of artwork in, uh, in, in many of our churches. In the past several weeks, we've heard stories from the gospel lessons, um, healing stories, stories in which Jesus has been, uh, been asked to heal someone. Two of those stories of healing were of children. A few weeks back, we heard that Jesus, about Jesus going to a home where a child was presumed to be dead, and Jesus raised her to health. More recently, we heard the story of how he healed the demon-possessed daughter of the Syrophoenician woman. A few chapters later in Mark's Gospel, we would read what's probably the best-known story about Jesus and children. Um, the story goes uh, that many in the crowd probably had heard of these healing miracles of, of Jesus and children, started bringing their children to him, um, hoping that he might um, bring a healing touch to them. And in this story, uh, the disciples are annoyed. They, they feel like this is a bit much. These parents are just, you know, kind of bombarding Jesus with their children. And they've got stuff to do. So they, they try to speak to the well-meaning parents and, and to take the children away. And Jesus gets kind of indignant. He's not happy with his disciples. And he says, and this is the line that many of us will recall, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. 
And then he takes the children into his arms, lays his hands on them, and blesses them. And that's where we get the picture in many of our congregations. So that's a few chapters before our lesson today, where we read something else that Jesus says about children. And that is the last line you heard me read. Whoever welcomes a child welcomes me. This is a, a powerful verse by itself with a the theme of welcoming children. And, and I would say on its own, just this verse deserves our attention. All congregations believe that ministry to children is important, no matter how many actual children they might have attending their congregation. Uh, back in Milwaukee, where I served as a pastor before coming uh, to Columbus to teach at the seminary, the backbone of our congregation's outreach ministry into the neighborhood was a monthly event for children that we called Community Night. We invited all of the children of the neighborhood, which was, we were in a very low income neighborhood in the inner city of Milwaukee, and we let the community know that we had this event every month. Um, and we invited the children to come to the church for dinner and fellowship, for Bible study, singing, crafts, and other activities. And above all, we, will, we were concerned, no matter what else happened at community night, that these children felt welcome, safe, and loved. And the kids loved it. And the adults loved it, too. And um, very often, the children's experiences at community night would lead them to come join us for worship on Sunday. And many of these children, in my, my number of years as pastor there, were eventually baptized and became members of the congregation. Sometimes they would bring their siblings and parents along with them. And this was, again, part of, um, part of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Milwaukee's kind of identity, this um, outreach into the neighborhood for children. We, we felt that we were listening to God's call to welcome these children into our church and helping them to grow in their faith. So this verse on its own about welcoming children, it uh, does us well, I think, as it stands alone. But when we look at it in the context of the whole gospel lesson that I just read, these verses, I think, say just something um, else, a little bit more to us this morning. And so that's what I want to focus on now. If we look back at the gospel lesson, these verses that I just read come right after last week's lesson, where Jesus explains to his disciples what it means that he's the Messiah. And it's not what they are expecting to hear, as you might remember. It means he will be betrayed and killed. It means that his destiny will lead him to the cross. And as he further explains to, him, to them, it means that to follow him also means for the disciples the way of the cross. And today's lesson starts with that very same message, re reiterating the point of Jesus' destiny, his suffering, and his death. And the disciples are, well, kind of dense about it. They don't seem to show the slightest understanding of what Jesus is talking about, but they know it makes them feel afraid. And so, as we often do when we're afraid of something, they fall into an argument about something that's more familiar to them, more comfortable. They begin arguing with each other about who's the greatest. So it seems like a kind of strange segue, but that's what we sometimes do when we don't want to think about something. We go to something that, you know, feels more comfortable. And we probably, when you, when you heard that read, you might have shake, shake your head a bit at that. But if we're honest with ourselves, we all do that in some way or another. Right? We compare ourselves to others, try to figure out where we rank among our peers, kind of where we stand in our various groups. Um, when I was a graduate student, also in Milwaukee, I went to Marquette. <laughs> this only happened one time in a class, but I got a paper back one time where my professor actually told me where I stood in the class. <laughs> he said, not only gave me a grade on my paper, I, I got an A on it, but he also said, this was the fourth best paper of this class. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I didn't really want to know that. <laughs> that was a little bit strange, but still stings a little because I was hoping it'd be, you know, I wanted it to be higher, right? Well, academics and, and dare I say sports uh, are two arenas in which there seem to be clear criteria for determining rankings, if not greatness. And yes, I watched the Buckeyes yesterday too, and uh, hoping that their ranking improves a bit after that game, although I don't know. And they're apparently fourth or fifth in the Big Ten, which is kind of disturbing. But we, we know how rankings work with sports, and if you've been a student, you know how they work as a, in academics. But in other areas of our lives, of course, it's much more complex. 
It'd be interesting to know what criteria the disciples were using to determine who was the greatest, what sort of things they might put up for comparison. Today, those of us um, here in, 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 this, in this context might, might compare our portfolios, our salaries, size of our homes, our children's achievements. In a church, of course, we can do this ranking thing too. We might, pastors sometimes do this with each other, you know, how many people will attend your service on Sunday? And there's that ranking, who's got the most people in worship attendance. But we also might use um, things like our church budget, our church endowment, who's the biggest endowment, the beauty of our worship space, the size of our youth group, our building, how many building projects we've undergone. I've heard pastors brag about that. Maybe how impressive our music program is, and you can get the idea. Jesus knows what they're doing. He knows what we're doing, and he confronts them. He tells them in no uncertain terms that whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. To be my disciples, he explains, means to abandon all position and rank. Don't go for it. Right? And just in case they still don't get it, and likely they're kind of dense, they're not, he takes a child into his arms as an object lesson. Right? And it's an object lesson that we might miss, though, because of the cultural differences between how we think about children today and how they were um, thought about in Jesus' day. Today, of course, children are very precious to us. Um, they're very important um, in society to protect and nurture children. But in Jesus' day, um, in Middle Eastern culture, children were not thought of that way. They were generally de denigrated as, well, kind of useless. I mean, infanticide was, was a thing. Um, and, and actually, the earliest Christians did not practice it, but it was practiced um, in, in the first century. And, and so children were seen as expendable. I mean, even, even in the Middle Ages, this didn't change. It changed. Christians, again, uh, didn't practice that. But Thomas Aquinas, a great theologian uh, of, the, of the Middle Ages, um, taught that if there was a fire, that it was the husband's duty to first save his father, then his grandmother, then his wife, and if he had time, the children, right? We would not put that, that order would be totally different today probably for us. Most parents would save their children first, I, I dare say. And, and in Thomas Aquinas' day in a famine, children were also to be fed last, right? So this was a survival of the fittest mentality in, in, the, in the first century. And, and this is, again, a very foreign concept to us today but if we think about how the disciples would have heard that in a society that, did, did, that thought of children as much more expendable as we do today, Jesus says to that cultural norm or attitude that he wants his disciples to become like vulnerable children, to become like what was seen as the most expendable, unimportant group of people in society, right? So that makes this sound a little bit different, I dare say. And in telling them if they wish to be first or greatest, they must become last. Um, he shows them what he means by putting the child in their midst. And then he says those words about welcoming a child, um, that whoever welcomes a child welcomes me. So to be Jesus' disciple means not only to give up one's own status, it means giving status to those who have had none in the first place, like children in first century um, in the first century world. New Testament scholar Donald Jewell notes, this is because accepting such an unimportant member of society in Jesus' name is, as he says, equivalent to accepting him. And accepting him is equivalent to accepting the one who sent him, God the Father, because of course Jesus is the divine Son of God. What Jesus is telling them is as simple as this, simple and as hard as this, hospitality a major aspect of life in the ancient world is now to be extended to the most unlikely, thus challenging for the first century, traditional notions of status. And indeed, hospitality to the unimportant, to the expendable, will be a hallmark of Jesus' followers, as it was in Jesus' own ministry. And this has everything to do with faithfulness to the one whose rejection and death mark the way to glory. And so, if we wish to be first in the kingdom, we must be willing to welcome the last, the least, the lonely, the lost. Those who do not rank 
in the eyes of the world. Those whom, for whatever reason, have been deemed expendable and therefore unimportant. Who are these people in our midst today? Again, perhaps not children generally, but what about children of migrants at the border? Or the homeless, the addicted, mentally ill, the elderly? Who are those we have deemed in society as expendable and unimportant? Whoever welcomes such, one such child in my name, Jesus says, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Jesus calls us to reach out to others, especially those with no status in the eyes of the world, to let them know that before God they are not last, least, lonely, or lost. You may know this, the story of the first missionaries to um, uh, India, uh, it, it, almost 300 years or more uh, ago, um, illustrates this point very beautifully. These missionaries, um, uh, Ziegenbald was one of them, uh, brought the gospel to the untouchables, the so-called untouchables, or today we would call them the Dalits, um, who in the caste system were at the very, very bottom and seen as the most unimportant and, and uh, inexpendable. And the missionaries taught them um, this very thing, that their worth was not based on their ranking in this rigid caste system of India, but rather on God's love for them. And that message was, of course, embraced and, and welcomed by them. And today, Lutheran churches in India include nearly 90% of all Dalit people. So that, that's a, a, a beautiful story. But here, siblings in Christ, is the thing you and I must not forget. No matter how we rank in the eyes of the world, not one of us here in this place of worship is here because we have somehow earned our place, because somehow we have been <laughs> named the greatest. None of us ranks up there with God on account of our own strength, power, will, or personal attributes or achievements. No, no one of us can boast that we have any status in the eyes of God because of what we have done or because of the things we've accomplished. No, as St. Paul reminds us, and we heard echoed in our confession this morning, all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. But hear the good news, beloved in Christ. In Jesus Christ, God has welcomed each one of us. In spite of that falling short, in spite of our sinfulness, the way, and in spite of the ways we might inside feel untouchable and unlovable. And in the waters of baptism, we, each one of us, has been welcomed into that family of God as God's own children. And, and as heirs to the promise of salvation. For it is on the cross, siblings in Christ, that Jesus opened his arms to welcome all. Thanks be to God. Amen. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me, who caused his pain, for me, who him to death pursued? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? He left his Father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. His mercy all immense and free, for thou, my God, it found out me. 
his mercy all immense and free for oh my god it found out me long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon filled with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Please stand for the Apostles' Creed. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of community, we pray for the church around the world. Unite us in our love for you. Help us overcome our divisions that we are encouraged to work together for your sake. Lord, in your mercy. God of creation, we pray for this hurting earth. Awaken in us a new desire to care for this world and empower us to, ch to support agencies, organizations, and individual efforts to heal our environment. Lord, in your mercy. God of cooperation, we pray for the nations of the world embroiled in conflict, inspire leaders to listen to each other and work toward peaceful solutions to disagreements. Protect the vulnerable, especially children, who cannot find safety in their home or country. Lord, in your mercy. God of comfort, we pray for all who live with mental or physical illness. Help them appro find appropriate care. Bring healing and wholeness when the path forward seems bleak. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of compassion, we pray for the young people in this congregation. Renew, us, re renew in us your call to welcome the children in our midst. As they grow, strengthen their faith and our commitment to them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of consolation, we give you thanks for our loved ones who have died and pray for all who grieve today. Shine your grace on all your saints. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent prophets to make known your loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we await the day when Jesus shall return to free all the earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Come, Lord Jesus, and let the church say, Amen. Amen. Send your Holy Spirit, our advocate, to fill the hearts of all who share this bread and cup with courage and wisdom to pursue love and justice in all the world. Come, Spirit of freedom, and let the church say amen. amen. Join our prayers and praise with your prophets and martyrs of every age, that rejoicing in the hope of the resurrection, we might live in the freedom and hope of your Son. Through him, with him, in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All who hunger and thirst, come. The table is ready. God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you now and forever.
Amen. Let us pray. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. The living word dwells in you. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. To God.